Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the NICC Parent Support Group presentation in collaboration with Musan uh, for the Community Resources for Individuals with Disabilities and Their Families. My name is Amina Al Ghazari and I am a member of the Parent Support Group and Noor Ohio Musan Group. Today's webinar is live streamed and will be available as a recording on our Noor Ohio YouTube channel. If you have questions uh, throughout the uh, presentation, please feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, we are excited to bring this important event to you to share important information uh, for, and resources for individuals with disabilities and their families. We are honored to have Sister Susan Musla as our guest speaker. Uh, Susan Musla is an attorney with extensive legal experience in both the private and public sectors, which include a background in civil rights and disability law. Having most recently served as uh, a lead attorney at Disability Rights Ohio, Suzanne su uh, supervised a team of attorneys on client matters and statewide systemic advocacy. Her work focused on the right to in uh, integrated community-based services as an alternative to institutional care in facilities and institutions, along with the right to be free from discrimination in the context of places of public accommodations and government services. She has collaborated with key Ohio stakeholders, participated in numerous coalitions, and served on advisory boards to advance the rights, inclusion, and equity of Ohioans with disabilities in various settings. Mrs. Musla earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from the University of Michigan in 2003 and her Juris Doctorate degree from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 2007. Suzanne remains committed to supporting and accommodating the needs of those with disabilities and their families within her local community. Suzanne. Jazak al Sister Amina for the very kind words and for taking the time out to monitor today. I really appreciate it and may Allah reward you for all of your efforts, inshallah. Uh, I also wanted to um, express my gratitude to the Nur Islamic Cultural Center, um, along with the Mohsen uh, group at Nur, um, for allowing me to be part of such a wonderful and important initiative. Um, I'd also like to recognize the beautiful Mohsen families that I recently got a chance to meet and who are inshallah in attendance today. Jazakum Allah khairun. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, community resources for individuals with disabilities and their families. Um, a lot of the reason why um, I wanted to do this is because I understand firsthand uh, how complex uh, the disability system and network is in Ohio. Um, I, I found myself many times, even as a professional on the phone, trying to get answers to you know, pretty simple questions. And I always wonder how um, caregivers and individuals with disabilities are able to get the answers they need um, when oftentimes their hands are tied. So um, I'm hoping that today I can help um, shed some light on how some of you know, um, the services and supports work and hopefully make things, um, inshallah, a little bit easier. Um, I wanted to also say that um, I'm going to be talking about several services and supports, but not all of them. This is not going to be um, a comprehensive list or a complete list. There are hundreds of services and supports for people with disabilities in Ohio, but so I'm going to really try to focus on like the big ticket items, right? Um, and, you know, I'm, my hope is that if anyone, you know, has any questions after reading through the material or hearing this presentation, that they feel free to reach out to our Marsen group um, and we can hopefully inshallah will point you in the right direction. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that um, the PowerPoint that um, I put together today, um, my hope is that it will serve as a resource guide. Um, I went ahead and put in links that will take you to these various resources. Um, inshallah, that way you'll, you kind of have everything in one place. So we will be making this um, presentation available to you shortly after um, our discussion here today. You can, you'll be able to find it, inshallah, in the YouTube and the Facebook video description. So please look out for that. And let's go ahead and get started. So these are the topics I'm going to be covering today. Um, the first thing is developmental disability services, physical disability services, mental health, special education, employment, 
Um, I'll give you some resources regarding disability advocacy organizations and legal services um, in case you ever you know, run into a situation where you need those. So we're gonna start with developmental disability services. Um, the first thing is that when you're talking about developmental disabilities, um, you, want to, um, you want to go to the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. They are the state agency. They pretty much lead the developmental disabilities a network and a system in Ohio. So, um, oh, let me, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. Um, so it's basically DODD, oversees the entire system. They are the ones who um, are going to administer all of, for instance, the Medicaid programs and things. Um, and the, they oversee the county boards, the providers, the family supports and everything. So um, they are really the ones in charge. It's almost like thinking of them as the head of the umbrella, right? Um, and under them are going to be county boards of developmental disabilities. Um, you can learn more about all of the programs and services offered um, from DODD um, if you click on this link right here. So the process of seeking disability or developmental disability services and supports really begins with your local county board. Um, there are 88 counties, so there are 88 county um, boards of developmental disabilities. You, um, you have to apply through your county board of DD uh, in the same county in which you live. So you cannot apply to you know, uh, a county board in another county. Um, and what happens is county boards of developmental disabilities are the ones who assess uh, your eligibility, your needs, uh, coordinate your services. So they're the ones that you're really going to be doing everything to. So the first step in the process is to locate your county board uh, in your area and give them a call. Um, I will say the other good thing about, um, you know, contacting your county board and starting services through your local county board of developmental disability is that if you are getting um, other services from for you know, maybe a child or an individual in your household who has a developmental disability from other networks and other providers, if you are connected to your county board of developmental disability, they will also provide oversight and assistance to those other services that you're also receiving uh, outside of the county board. So it's really nice because the, they will coordinate together and they will also make sure that the ball is rolling. So it's really important to, um, to get connected to your county board. Um, these are some of the services and supports offered by your County Board of Developmental Disability. Um, it's, it's really a wide variety. Um, you know, you can have anything from transportation, vocational rehabilitation, waivers, which is um, something we're going to be talking about here in a little bit. Um, so, it, you know, it just, these are all, um, you know, um, services that they can work with you on, support you on, um, coordinate and um, inshallah help pay for these things. So um, there is certain types of um, uh, requirements in order to be eligible for services through your local county board of developmental disability. One is that you must have a developmental disability. Um, and this is a pretty specific um, definition, although it's, it, you know, it's, it's pretty broad at the same time in the sense that you just have to make sure that um, the condition is something that um, you've developed prior to age of 22, and that it is a severe and chronic, chronic disability um, that would cause mental or physical uh, impairments. Um, and then the second part really um, is something that is going to differ depending on your age, um, for the age of the person who is applying for services. Um, if you are six or older, you must have at least three um, functional limitations. And the list is here of what some examples of what that might look like. You have to have at least three of those. If you are between the ages of three and five, you have to have two developmental disability or two um, developmental delays. And then if you are, um, younger than three, you have to have one, or you have to be at risk to having a developmental 
uh, delay. Uh, a couple things when you are first contacting the board about eligibility and these things is that you really want to make sure that you have a lot of documentation that you can initially give to the county board. If available, um, provide things like, you know, evaluations, reports, um, diagnoses with evaluation dates, and even the qualifications of um, the diagnosing phys physician. Um, for adults, you want to um, you want to make sure that um, anything, any documents you have of um, of your disability manifesting before the age of 22, uh, prior school records, again, di doctor diagnoses, always um, prior to the age of 22. And then also, um, if if you are eligible, you're going to get what's called a um, a service, um, an individual service plan, it's called an ISP. It's going to be a plan that is specialized uh, basically to your needs. And it's going to be specific to the services and supports that that individual needs. So um, if you do, if you do um, become eligible and to get services through your county board, you want to also um, work really closely with what is called your services and support administrator. Um, it's an SSA. Um, pretty much it's like the case manager, all right? And so that SSA is going to be in charge of making sure that you are receiving the supports and services that you, know, you talked about in your plans and that your goals for yourself are being met. So um, you want to just make sure that you explain to them the things you're looking to get from their services and supports and that it is a plan that is right for you. Um, also, what, when you are providing these documents and trying to apply for services and supports, the County Board of Developmental Disability will have you do an assessment. Um, there are two main assessments. Uh, one is for people who are 16 and older, and that one is called the OETI. Um, and then the second one is going to be for um, people who are 6 to 15, so children, and it's called the COETI. Um, so basically, this helps the board determine uh, that individual with disabilities um, abilities and what supports and, uh, you know, what type of needs they have and what type of services they're going to need. Um, so they're going to ask you to do something to do those assessments. Um, these documents um, will also play a part in determining eligibility for DD services. It'll help them under, figure out which supports and which services you'll need. Um, and uh, one thing I'll mention about the co-eddy is that um, when you're doing these assessments, keep in mind, um, especially parents, keep in mind that these assessments are based on what your child is unable to do. To, so you have to establish a need for services. So just keep in mind that you want to make sure that um, you are really thorough and detailed in getting across that um, you know, your child needs, you know, certain services and supports. Um, <clears throat> so for, so we've talked about, you know, the OEDI and the COEDI and, you know, the COEDI, like I said, is for, you know, starts from age six. So what happens with um, kids who are a little bit younger, there are, there is an early intervention um, program for um, kids who are age three and younger. Um, so this is for parents when they are either they're starting to see a developmental delay um, or they just recently got um, a diagnosis of a developmental delay, right? A couple things is that um, to know is that your family income will not factor into uh, your child's eligibility for early intervention service. Um, the screening, the evaluations, it is all free. Um, it's a wonderful program. They will uh, coordinate services for your family um, and they will um, help you get started really early on in life, which always gives the child um, the best advantage. Um, uh, let's see here. 
Oh, uh, one other thing that was what I wanted to mention. One other thing that I wanted to mention is you can also, so you can contact this number here, uh, the or you can um, click on that link and it'll take you to the Ohio Early Intervention application um, and program where you can apply there. But you can also apply through your um, to, through like a physician that your child might see um, or other people who might work with your child at those early stages. And also know that for children over three, you can always apply for services uh, through your local uh, county or, or through your local school district. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the waiver system in Ohio. Um, this is probably the thing that most people ask about. Um, these are Medicaid-funded waivers. Um, they are called home and community-based waivers. Um, the idea of these waivers is, think of it as um, money <laughs> that you get um, that will cover services and support so that an individual with disabilities can with developmental disabilities can remain in their home and live within their community versus having to move into a facility or a hospital. Uh, waivers are wonderful. Um, they they really provide a lot of funding and so many different wonderful support options. Um, so much so that <laughs> there was a time where um, I think there were. 50,000 people waiting to get a waiver in Ohio a few years back. I'll talk a little bit about that more in the next slide, but they are very highly sought after, um, but the process can be um, complicated and a little bit frustrating. You do have to um, meet a certain level of care uh, in order to uh, get a waiver, um, but some of the services that it covers can be anything from, you know, getting groceries, uh, someone coming to your house to help you get groceries, take you to your doctor's appointment, take you maybe to your, your adult child or um, to, to college, uh, things like that. So it really covers so many different things. There are three main types of waivers. Each one has a uh, different spending limit um, and covers different amount of services. So the three main waivers are the, what's called the IO waiver. Um, this is the big ticket item. It is the one that um, covers the most services and there's not necessarily um, this like limited funding with an IO waiver. What they do is they do this assessment called the ODDP assessment. And that will determine the amount of funding that you'll get under the IO waiver, which can be pretty, pretty high, right? And um, again, it really does offer the most services, especially when it comes to HPC services, which is what I was, or HPS services, which is what I was talking about on the last slide, uh, which is where, you know, you're getting home and, and personal care coming to your house and people coming to your home and helping you with things, whether even be with your bills and, and managing things. So um, it's a wonderful um, resource if you are able to get on an IO waiver. Uh, the next one is a level one waiver. Um, this one does have a spending cap um, and it has some limits, um, but it's more for people who might not, you know, need as much, right? Uh, maybe they're not struggling as much as someone who's going to need an IO waiver. Their um, functional limitations and whatnot may not be as, um, as uh, extreme. And then you have what's called the self waiver. This is um, basically for people who, um, you know, who are eligible for waivers and, and who want more control over who their provider is and the types of services that they receive. You can be in charge of the hiring and the training of the people that provide you services if you um, get a self waiver. And um, to learn more about the different types of uh, services offered in these waivers, I have included a link to a comparison chart because there is a lot more to say here on these waivers, uh, to be honest. Um, generally, a discussion on waivers is something that, you know, is, is broken down into a webinar series. There is so much to learn about it, but I did at least want to take the time to um, touch on it because it is something that if you are able to get on a waiver, it is something you definitely want to, um, to seek out and try to establish. Um, 
uh, you know, the, the great thing I think about waivers is that it really helps keep families intact. Um, there's been so many times where I've seen individuals with developmental disabilities put into facilities and institution and taken away from, you know, the loved ones who may be more in tune with their individual needs. Um, so what's great about a waiver is it gives um, the member of the family, the individual with disabilities, a way to still live with their loved ones, also integrate in the community, um, and it just prevents or it just promotes um, greater opportunities for social inclusion. And um, it, it's just a wonderful thing to hopefully, you know, establish if you're able to um, fit the eligibility criteria. Um, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So um, to be eligible for a waiver, you uh, need to do what's called an Ohio Needs Waiver Waiting List Assessment. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, a few years ago, there was a really high demand for waivers, um, and, and there usually is, but particularly a few years ago, the way the system used to work is that there used to be this waiver waiting list, um, and anyone who wanted a waiver could just call a county board and say, hey, um, I wanna be on a waiver. And the county board would say, okay, we're gonna put you on this waiver waiting list, right? Well, then over time, um, you know, it, you know it, this waiver waiting list grew to almost 50,000 Ohioans being on it. And anyone who was waiting for a waiver was waiting for many years before they even were you know, at the top of the list. So around 2018, uh, the county boards um, changed the waiver and the state changed the waiver waiting list system. And they decided that um, waivers would be based on if someone had a particular need. Because in the old system, people would just get on the waiting list. And oftentimes they would not even know why they were on a waiting list. They'd say, I don't, you know, a county board would call them years later and they would say, hey, you know, your number came up, you know, you said you, you put yourself on the waiver waiting list and we're calling to see what services sports you need. And the person would say, I, you know, I don't know what I need. Uh, someone told me to get on the waiver waiver list and here I am. So what they did was they started this um, new process, which is you need to show that you um, are in need of services uh, within the next 12 months or an immediate need within the next 30 days. Um, and this assessment is the tool that they use to determine your, your, your needs, right? And whether you do need waiver services within the next 12 months or in the next um, 30 days. Um, so a couple things here. When you are in this, when you are going to do the waiver waiting list assessment, it's really important um, that you understand that the individual with disabilities is going to need to, um, is, is going to be assessed for what they cannot do. And again, as I mentioned before, um, it's not based on what they can do, but what they cannot do. So I always explain to, especially parents, when you're doing these assessments, think of the, the worst case scenario that you've seen your child in, right? They want to hear about what do you need from them? What services are going to um, help in certain situations? This can be a little um, tricky for some parents because you know we always like to talk about what uh, mashallah, our children are able to do and so forth. So, um, and we also want to always help them, right? And say, oh, well, we help them with this and this and that. But this process is, is very different. Um, you'll need to show how you need help um, and um, whether that be, you know, an adult, whether that be a child, um, you'll want to organize documents from your doctors or providers to help show this. Um, you'll also um, want to keep daily logs. Um, I always tell parents, try to keep daily logs and so that you can see and figure out what, you know, your child or the uh, adult in your home uh, may need throughout the day and that you are prepared to do this assessment. Um, I would also recommend that you do a practice assessment at home um, and try to answer some of the questions so that you are prepared. Um, finally, I would say that um, it's really important to look out for some of the 
key buzzwords that are used when, um, when the staff is doing these assessments. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes they will use words like what's called um, natural supports. These are basically voluntary supports um, uh, that they that are that parents will do. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have a um, a child in your home and you are trying to do this assessment and get services and supports for them. And you say, well, um, you know, I do such and such for my child at home. And they say, oh, okay, well, you can, you're willing to transport your child to school every day and, and so forth. And you're like, yeah, you know, this is something I, I can do, right? They're going to say, oh, okay, well, that's natural support. So then you don't need anything from us, right? So, you know, just be careful, you know, all of us, want to do as much as we can for our child, inshallah, but um, you really do want to spend your time when talking about the assessment of highlighting the things that you aren't able to do for your child and that you really need help with. Um, and also um, the other thing I was going to say is that, um, you know, just again, when you're talking about your child and what they can and cannot do, um, this this become, this can be a little challenging for um, parents who describe their child as high functioning. So a lot of times you'll hear, um, you know, like someone say, "Oh, you know, my my child is high functioning on, on the on the spectrum and so forth," and they may interpret that as um, as then you not needing certain services for your child, right? And just know that individuals can be high functioning and extremely intelligent, um, but they may have also some type of social skill delay and that could um, prevent them from being at the level that they want, want or need to be at with, while living in the community. So you just wanna get that across when you're doing that assessment. You really just, again, wanna focus on what someone can't do and why you need those services. So very important to, you know, practice and be prepared. And you can also reach out to some of the advocacy groups that I'm going to be listing here soon to, um, to get some more advice and help on preparing for this assessment. Um, next, um, I'm going to just I'm not going to go into the, this, but I just wanted to just really say, if in case there's people here who might already have, be on a waiver, there has recently been some amendments to um, the Medicaid waivers. So um, they're going to start on July 1st. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up. If you weren't aware, um, I did include this really short video that does a wonderful job briefly explaining the upcoming changes if you wanna check that out. So um, finally, what I will just say about waivers is um, there you do have, um, and not just waivers, but um, when you're when you are connected with your county board for services and supports, you do have um, due process rights. If you are unhappy with a decision that your county board makes, um, if you are dissatisfied maybe with your supports or services. Um, you know, it could be that you don't like your SSA um, or, you know, you're looking for, an, you know, a new SSA or you're looking to get more services or maybe a decision was made to terminate your services or reduce, you know, Medicaid funded supports. So if you find yourself in that situation, um, just know that you have a right to receive notices. You have a right to request all documentation. Again, you can file a complaint. You can file an appeal. Um, one caveat I will say is that if you do choose the route of filing an appeal, for instance, just know that there are several different, um, very crucial timelines and deadlines that you need to file uh, within a certain time limit. Um, and then, and the reason I say crucial is because there are particular um, appeals that you, if you want to file, like for instance, um, through jobs and family services, if you're gonna go through their appeal process, just know that they have, um, they'll give you 90 days for instance to file an appeal. But if you have established services and supports in place, if you do not within 15 days state to them your intent to file an appeal, they can actually cut off your services and supports um, 
right then and there. And then you wouldn't have any services and supports in, throughout the time that you are appealing. But if you tell them within those first 15 days that you um, have an intention to file an appeal, then they have to keep your services and supports in place throughout the appeal process until a decision is made. So that's really important. That can often be a matter of life and death for many um, when you're talking about having, you know, supports instantly cut off for someone with disabilities. So I just wanted to put that out there. If you find yourself in that situation, um, you should really contact one of the legal organizations that I'm going to be, um, or if you have a lawyer, but I have also um, included some resources of uh, legal services um, at the end of this presentation that you should check out if you do find yourself in any of these situations. Next, I just wanted to add here that um, there, there are some services that, um, some actually wonderful supports and services for children that uh, many are unaware of. And one of, this, one of these is what's called EPSDT. Um, in Ohio that is called Health Check. If, um, what's great about this is if you are under the age of 21, 21 and enrolled in a Medicaid program, you can, for instance, like I was talking about waivers, if you have a child who has, is on a waiver, you can automatically apply or automatically put them into EP SDT from additional funding without having to apply. So if they are already Medicaid eligible, then they're automatically eligible for EP SDT services. Um, so it's just an extra way to get more funding for various services. And what's great about this service is that it covers a comprehensive amount of uh, medical and healthcare services. I mean, it can cover dental, vision, all of these wonderful things. So um, if Medicaid tells you, for instance, that you can't get a particular service that you need, make sure you can get the service under health check. So um, it's, really, it's really a great resource. Um, many do not know about it, but I did want to include it in here for parents. Um, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's really um, very comprehensive and it's a good way to, to get your child um, in a way early intervention and get them started and make sure that um, these, you know, these wraparound services are taken care of. Um, this is another one for children that I wanted to include. Um, it's called the Children with Medical Handicaps Program. It is through actually the Ohio Department of Health. Um, this one is actually covers children who have a developmental disability along with a physical disability. Um, CMH, you know, may be able to cover services that are not covered by insurance or Medicaid in the same way that Health Check can. So, um, you know, and the other thing about this particular program is that um, it covers any child under the age of 21. It will... Um, it will also cover any a child who is born with a disability or later develops one. So that's, again, why it is a developmental and physical disabilities um, funding source. Um, I went ahead, I won't go through it all here, but I did go ahead and list um, some of the diagnoses um, that are covered under uh, this program. Inshallah, um, you will find that beneficial. Um, let's see here. Oh, next, I wanted to also provide um, some resources in regards to um, developmental disabilities network, right? There are several advocacy groups out there who really ad go out of the way to advocate for parents and families and individual with disabilities. And the Arc of Ohio is one of the top ones. Um, they have what's called a family choice program. Um, what's great about that is that if your child is on one of the waivers I was discussing earlier, the self level one IO waiver, um, the Arc of Ohio through this program will help coordinate um, the services. They will um, help you help the family to kind of take control over getting their own providers and 
um, getting the providers that they're happy with. So if you do have a child who did get, who was lucky enough, hopefully, inshallah, to get a waiver, then you do want to um, check out the resources at the Arc of Ohio under this program. And again, the Arc of Ohio is one of the leaders in the developmental disability world. Um, they do a lot of advocacy. I would definitely check out their page. They have wonderful resources. Um, and they also have an assistive technology program, if that is something anyone is um, thinking that they might need. Um, some other leaders in the developmental disability world is, uh, is the Ohio Devel Developmental uh, Disabilities Council, the Disability Rights Ohio, University of Cincinnati Center for Excellence in Developmental Disability, and the Nysager Center at Ohio State. These four um, organizations have actually come together to work together and form what is called the Developmental um, Disabilities Network. They often partner on various um, statewide advocacy initiatives. They also help individual, individuals with developmental disabilities and their family. They have an unbelievable amount of source, resources. So if you are, if you do have a family member who has a developmental disabilities, um, it's really important to probably check um, any one of these organizations out. They have a lot of training, a lot of webinars, um, and it's something that you should always keep an eye out for. They have wonderful events and uh, resources on all of their web page, web, web pages. <clears throat> Another one would be Ocali. Um, they um, they are the um, organization specifically for individuals with autism around the spectrum, but they do also cover um, individuals with physical disabilities as well. They have a wonderful uh, library of books and DVDs, assistive technology resources all over their website, and they have come up with a great uh, parents guide, which really provides a lot of tips um, to navigate um, the dis developmental disability and physical disability networks in Ohio. Um, if you get a chance to check that out, uh, I would definitely take a look at that as well. Now I'm going to be talking about um, services for those with physical disabilities. Um, I'm going to be discussing low cost Ohio services um, for people with physical disabilities, such as um, you know anything from physical therapy, employment, education services, independent living, assistive technology. The number one thing that um, people with um, physical disabilities are looking for when they're reaching out for services and ports is usually information about what's called the home and community-based waiver, um, particularly the Ohio Care Waiver Program. Um, similar to the waivers I talked about before, um, which were for people with developmental disabilities, there is a home care waiver for people with physical disabilities. Um, this one covers um, individuals um, who are 60 and, or below the age of 60, so 59 years and younger. You do have to be financially eligible for Medicaid, and you have to... Um, be in need of skilled or intermediate care, um, nursing services, personal care assistance, and skilled therapy services, and things like this, transportation, adaptive services. The idea of this waiver is similar to um, the, the developmental disability waivers in the sense that this waiver is used to help keep individuals out of nursing facilities, homes, and, and institutions, right? So this is a way that for people who have pretty severe physical um, disabilities and um, you know high needs to not have to live in a skilled nursing home, but still remain at home within the community and still be able to get the supports and services that they need. Um, this program is actually through Jobs and Family Services. So uh, they're the ones who will process your application. You will um, need to first find your county um, jobs and Family Services Office. I went ahead and included the directory page here at the bottom so that you're able to do that. Um, and then once you get started, you could, um, you know, go on their website also and do um, 
an assessment. They have different assessments to see if this is something you might need. Um, some other resources for people with um, physical disabilities is um, some resources for the blind and the visually impaired community. Um, I went ahead and listed, um, you know, there's, there's many, like I said, throughout the state, but these I think are the ones that you hear often about. Um, and that is through um, the Ohio Bureau of Services for the Visually Impaired. This one here is for um, vocational rehabilitation services, which I'll be talking more about in a little bit here, um, which is basically um, em employment services for people who are visually impaired or blind. Um, if, you, if you want to go ahead and check that one out, that is through OOD. Uh, next is the Ohio State School of the Blind. Um, if you have a child who is looking to attend a school or even summer camps, they have a lot of wonderful um, information and resources and even events and activities. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, and then I've also included a couple more here at the bottom. Next are some resources for individuals who are of the hard of hearing and deaf community. Um, similar to um, the visually impaired and the blind, I have included um, some resources for specific employment service programs for the deaf community and hard of hearing. Um, these are again through OOD. Um, it, 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 it really is about um, transition services, vocational rehabilitation programs, again, which I will get more into here in a little bit. Um, there are also Ohio Deaf Service, there's the Ohio Deaf Service Centers, which uh, basically um, also uses various centers throughout Ohio and for any, for all different locations throughout the state. Um, which will allow um, interpreting services, assistive technology, peer supports, advocacy, and so forth. And then there is also the Ohio School for Deaf. Um, if you have a child looking for services or you know who's on an IEP, that is definitely one of the facilities you will want to check out. Uh, next is assistive and supportive technology resources. So um, for those of you who don't know, assistive technology is really any anything that can be used right to increase or maintain or improve the functional capabilities of a person with disabilities so um, it, it helps anybody who has difficulty speaking typing writing um, walking really anything it's a very broad definition right and some examples of assistive technology could be things like braille this you know screen reading software i think a lot of people think of things like text-to-speech, technical things, but it can also be walkers in wheelchairs. Basically, anything that helps improve the life of an individual with disabilities can be counted as assistive technology. If you are looking for uh, resources regarding assistive technology, um, Ohio's Developmental Disability Council has put together a wonderful web page of different assistive technology services and resources based on various categories. I've included them here. If you um, want to review the topics and click on any of those, you'll be able to find um, the services that you need, inshallah. Next is mental health. Um, so I'm not gonna delve too much into mental health services for a couple different reasons. Uh, one being that, um, as we all know, mental health service is an extremely um, sensitive and important topic that I think would be best covered in a very in-depth discussion, one that we, you know, given that we're talking about so much today, won't be able to do justice here today in the short time frame. But, and the second reason is really that, um, you know, um, mashallah, our Muslim community is been doing such a wonderful job in raising awareness and has really taken the lead on many of these mental health issues, um, even groups within our own Nur Islamic Cultural Center. So I do want to highlight those today um, and we can talk about a little bit of those here. Um, I really wanna put the focus on them and just provide a lot of resources in the mental health realm and inshallah, um, in the coming months, we can talk more about these various services and supports. 
Um, so I'll start with, um, you know, the, like I mentioned, the North Islamic Culture Center, our masjid has what's called a Muslim mental health aid. This is um, a group of various professional psych psych or, um, psychologists, social workers, uh, guidance counselors, Muslim chaplain, medical physician who have come together to um, really raise awareness, um, begin advocacy, serve as community or liaisons to community resources and for those in need. Um, I, mashallah, they're doing such a wonderful job in, in trying to get this program up and running. Um, I have went ahead and included their contact information here. Their hope is to, inshallah, include um, men their mental health experts in the uh, Noor a Medical Clinic um, that, they that they offer. So um, please, if you're looking for more information on that, please reach out. Um, also, we have the um, My, oh, My Project USA in Ohio. Um, they do a wonderful job with the youth. Um, they really, they help uh, victims and at-risk youth uh, who have went through violence and abuse. Um, they have, uh, they offer crisis services. They have a wonderful helpline um, dedicated to helping out youth in crisis. Um, and then there's also Care Ohio, uh, which has um, launched the Muslim Healthcare Professionals Advocacy Network. They also do a lot of work with empowering our Muslim youth um, through their youth leadership program, workshops, trainings, and so forth. And then um, finally, we also have, um, as I'm sure many of you know, the Muslim Family Services in Ohio. Um, an absolutely wonderful organization, organization as well. Um, they also um, will work to stabilize individuals who are in a crisis and they help empower families and really try to work with families to get the best health outcome um, in various situations. So those are all resources that I want to take the time to highlight first that we have um, in the, when we're talking about mental health. Um, so please reach out um, if you ever find yourself in a situation or a family member in a crisis situation. Um, in regards to the state level agencies, I have went ahead and included um, Ohio Moss, which is the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. They're the ones who coordinate all of the mental health and addiction prevention and treatment and recovery service programs throughout the state. They are the state agency. And then um, there's NAMI Ohio, Disability Rights Ohio, and many more here. Um, for the sake of time, I will not go through all of them, but I did want to at least provide those links to you and a brief description of what all of those um, organizations provide, inshallah, along with their webpage, so you can um, hopefully take a look at that if that's something that you're interested in. Additionally, I have also concluded some nationwide agencies. Um, I did this mostly because these are, these are, um, you know, nationwide agencies such as like the CDC and HHS who have a lot of research and studies on these various mental health issues available on their web pages. They actually also will make local referrals. So if you call and reach out to some, an organization like SAMHSA, they will actually point you in the right direction to who you need to speak to even in Ohio or in your you know, city. So uh, I definitely wanted to make sure you guys had that information as well. Um, the last thing I will say um, when talking about mental health um, is that there is a new program called Ohio Rise. Um, it, it is something that is going to start in July 1st, on July 1st, uh, 2022. Um, it has not started yet, but um, I just wanted to do a quick brief um, uh, explanation of it. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to the Ohio Rise program, but I just wanted to put it on your radar because it is up and coming here and around the corner. But it is for youth who have very complex and uh, behavioral multi-system needs. Um, I said mental health um, because that's usually one of, one of the diagnoses that a child um, in this program may have. This program is really for someone, for instance, who um, 
who has maybe a developmental disability, a physical disability, along with mental health um, disability or, you know, disability. And so their needs are just not being met wherever, you know, they are, whether that be, you know, at home, within the community, at schools or whatnot. What happens with these youth often who have complex um, behavioral needs is that they are often serviced by so many different providers and that can be very problematic. So if a child has physical disabilities, developmental disabilities and mental health uh, concerns and they are you know, trying to navigate the DD world and um, the mental health world, a lot of times those systems can actually do a disservice to each other for one individual, meaning you may not be eligible for funding in one just because you're getting services from another. Um, and it can lead to um, a lot of disadvantages for a child who is having to deal with these various systems. It makes it, one, it's complex, two, they're not getting the most out of their services and supports. Families are having to deal with several funding issues. So um, the state came together in many different agencies to create Ohio Rise program. Um, it's kind of a one-stop shop where, um, where there's going to be kind of this umbrella of services under this program. Um, and what's going to happen is that a child who presents with complex and multi-system needs is going to get, be able to get their services all coordinated. So even when they're working with, you know, an agency here and an agency there for different disabilities that they may have, these, these um, agencies are now going to work together and make sure that, you know, their services are not interrupted, that there is a continuation of supports and um, for that child to, so that child can have the best means at, you know, in, at being successful um, in their lives. So, um, some of the eligibility requirement I have listed here below is that uh, you have to be aged zero, or sorry, from birth to age 20 uh, at the time of enrollment. You have to, as I mentioned, have significant behavioral health issues, and you have to meet a functional needs threshold for behavioral health. Um, there's what's called a CANS tool that they're going to use to assess the youth. Um, and uh, I won't go through it all, but I've included the services that are going to be available here. Um, there's going to also be three different tiers of a level of care. Uh, one is going to be, you know, from it's going to be like intermediate, um, moderate, intense. Those mean very much different things. There's going to be um, comprehensive home and community community based services, meaning they're going to allow a child, they're gonna make it so that children who might still need uh, services for, you know, a lot of services for uh, intense behavioral needs still remain in the home, which is wonderful. Um, usually there's a lot of times these children do get sent to facilities and institutions. So something like Ohio Rise is going to, inshallah, give these kids an opportunity to remain in their home with their families and provide them services in their home, even though um, their needs are complex, inshallah. But there are also situations where they are going to have what's called a PRTF, where a child um, will be played, may need to be placed in a psychiatric um, or psychiatric residential treatment facility. Um, the difference here with Ohio Rise is that. Um, for many reasons that I won't get into here, these children who need to be um, in these types of facilities are often sent in Ohio out of state. So Ohio Rise, what they're trying to do is now have these facilities here so that um, these children, instead of being sent out of state to these facilities, they'll be able to at least remain in the same state as their families and inshallah closer. So um, there's a lot of other other advantages to this program. It is a very ambitious program they're looking to serve. I think it's something along the lines of 50,000 kids in Ohio with this program. Um, but again, I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar um, in case you do have a child who has um, these complex needs. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about special education. 
Um, this is a topic I won't delve too much into um, because special education is a very uh, complex and vast system. Um, and mashallah, in our Mohsen group, we have amazing uh, special education specialists, um, uh, intervention specialists who inshallah are hoping to do um, a talk on this very topic here in the coming months. Um, I understand that we are at the beginning of summer and there may be some of you out there who uh, want to get some information on establishing those services before the next school year. I do recommend that you um, reach out to um, our Mahsan group. I went ahead and um, you'll see at the end of this presentation included our contact information. If you do have any questions uh, regarding special educational services, because you're worried that the school year is, you know, is going to be coming up and you need um, some help here soon. But um, I will also be providing right now a lot of resources um, available as well for services that you can also um, check out and turn to if, if you have any questions. I will just briefly say a few things about um, special education. Um, one is that, um, special education should really be, uh, or special education services should really be designed to meet a student's individual unique needs. Um, these are services that if your child is eligible for special education are free through public school. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone here does know that these services are required. Um, by your public school and that they, that they are of no cost. And special education services could be anything from, you know, specially designed instructions, um, accommodations, modifications, anything. Um, so it, there's a plethora of different services and supports um, in the special education realm. If your child has qualified for special education services, there are two types of special education plans um, that your child could be placed on. Um, one is called a, four, a 504 plan. Um, and this one is basically um, making sure that your child has the same access to, this, to the learning environment as their peers, right? And so um, it is through the free and appropriate public education's law um, and um, if you do get on this 504 plan, you will be able to get various special education services to make sure that there are no barriers in the way of your child meeting um, the goals and the needs that he needs, to, that he or she may need to meet uh, to be on the level of their peers. Uh, next is what is called an IEP. It is an individualized education program. Um, there are certain di disabilities um, that um, qualify someone to be on an IEP. And the purpose of an IEP is just to make sure that the child is um, getting a meaningful education program that again is unique to their individual needs. Um, finally, um, I'll just do a quick mention here about transition planning services. Um, this is basically a process in getting services that help your child figure out what they would like to do and what goals they would like to reach um, after, for instance, high school and their post-secondary uh, education. So this process begins here in Ohio um, at the age of 14, usually. Um, these training, there's many different agencies and many different supports available to help students um, with transition planning, which I'm going to I'm going to get into in my next slides, inshallah. But just know that um, when when a child is doing transition planning, um, they will do that. It'll be something that is written out in their IEP. Usually, there will be an IEP team uh, that meets regularly to discuss transitions plans. It should be with your child, and your and the parent should also be a part of that process. Uh, the IEP process in general is really complex, um, so um, it's really important to always ask about, you know, evaluations, findings, um, the goals that have been recommended for your child's IEP, 
And also that, again, making sure that you are part of your, the process for your child. Um, I always say that parents know their child best and they should really play a central role in creating any type of IEP to make sure it's tailored to your child's specific needs. And I'm going now to go ahead and discuss those resources I was talking about, various agencies that help with things like transition planning um, for a student who has developed or who has disabilities. Um, the first resource most people visit is the Ohio Department of Education. Um, I went ahead and listed um, the various um, services and supports um, that Ohio Department of Education provides for individuals with these particular types of disabilities. They have also put together a wonderful parents' rights in special education guide that I recommend everyone um, who is um, looking for special education services or has questions uh, review. Um, next is uh, the Department of Developmental Disabilities. Um, they also, as I mentioned, that was the one I was talking about earlier through the waivers and Medicaid programs, but another thing that they offer as well through DODD is transition um, planning. And they can help your child um, work with the school and with the families in getting the transition planning process moving along. Um, so they will help with services and supports and making sure that there's care coordination. So this is another advantage of being connected to your local county board. Um, oftentimes what happens is if you are, again, um, connected with your local county board, they will work with your teachers, maybe a therapist, and, you know, and have um, everyone in the same room, the parents and the child, to all work together as a team for things like transition planning, whether that be transition planning for uh, employment purposes or educational purposes. Um, next is Disability Rights Ohio. Um, they have an entire department that is dedicated to special education. They offer several resources and have created over the years many various brochures um, that I hope you find helpful here. Um, just about two weeks ago, they had actually put together what's called um, Rise Up, a practical guide for young advocates with disabilities. This guide is wonderful for um, families, for young adults with disabilities. Um, this, this guide um, really gives a lot of helpful tips to families, parents, and students who are looking to navigate through these various systems. Um, it does not only cover special education, it covers things like employment, housing, um, DD services, the waivers that I was um, discussing earlier. So if you get a chance to check that out, um, that is another wonderful resource. Um, they will also help with um, any um, special education services um, that you might be dissatisfied with, um, issues you're having. Um, they also offer free special education uh, legal clinics. I believe it's the second Monday of every month but I did go ahead and um, include um, the links to those clinics as well in here. Um, next, I'll say uh, Ocali, which I had mentioned earlier, the Center for Autism. Um, they actually have a Lifespan Transition Center. Um, this really helps also with the transition planning for students with disabilities. It's a wonderful resource. If that is something you're looking for, um, I would definitely check out that center as well. Uh, finally, is the Ohio Coalition for the uh, Education of Children with Disabilities. Uh, it's a statewide nonprofit. Um, it has over 70 <laughs> members. It's a huge coalition. They're always doing various types of advocacy events and so forth, um, in case you want to learn more about the various resources or updates going on in the special education uh, realm. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about employment services for those with um, disabilities. When, when discussing employment services for individuals with disabilities in Ohio, um, the number one agency that, um, that these services are you know, going to go through is going to be OOD, which is Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Um, what 
what they offer is actually the state's vocational rehabilitation service. Um, OOD manages the VR program in the state of Ohio. Um, it is a program that is for individuals with disabilities. If it's an adult, it is for um, them to get and help them get and maintain a job. Um, same thing for the youth. Um, it does start at the age of 14 and it will help um, youth transition, not just from high school into college, as I mentioned earlier, but also in the workplace. Um, it's a wonderful um, service. Um, they, you know, um, they have um, regional offices for all of the 88 counties in Ohio. You will have to locate your, um, the office nearest to you. I went ahead and included um, the, the search for um, determining the contact information for your office, for your local office. Um, but one of the things um, to get started in this process that you'll want to do is visit their webpage and do what um, the self-assessment that they provide on there to see if it's something that um, you feel you know your child or you as an adult would, would need. Um, but it is a program too that um, partners with all of uh, several other agent state agencies throughout the state, um, one being ODE, DODD, um, and um, and Disability Rights Ohio also has many resources on the employment services offered through ODD. Um, what I will say is that, um, uh, so if you, if you are seeking out these services and you get established with vocational rehabilitation services and you ever, um, become dissatisfied and you cannot maybe, maybe you don't get this vocational rehabilitation services that you, that you're have that you like, or you're having problems with the counselor, there, there's going to be these um, vocational rehabilitation counselors that are assigned to your, to your case. And um, if you are dissatisfied with those services, um, DRO, actually Disability Rights Ohio has what's called a client assistance program. It's called the CAP program. The opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities actually um, put, put on their webpage, they recommend that any type of complaints or appeals that you uh, want to make, uh, you should reach out to the DRO's client assistant program. So if you are already established, your child is already established, or you're an adult already established with uh, OD, OD's vocational rehabilitation program, and you know you run into any issues, that is really the place to go for that. Uh, next, um, these are just some more employment services, um, oh, more um, supports and services uh, for uh, transition planning. Um, so the next one here is um, the ODE. As I mentioned, ODE is a partner. Uh, of OOD when it comes to um, post-school outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, I've included some fact sheets here that really um, do a wonderful job summarizing the process. Um, another one would be Employment First. This one actually is um, a resource for employment transition planning specifically for people with developmental disabilities. Again, if you um, have a student or a child who is 14 and older and has a developmental disability and um, needs some help with either getting a job, keeping a job, maybe some training and trying to figure out what, you know, what type of employment they'd like to do, setting up goals and so forth. Employment First is really the source that you want to reach out to for someone with developmental disabilities um, when you're seeking employment services. Um, and just another one is Ohio Means Jobs. Ohio Means Jobs does a wonderful job in helping um, people find employment. Um, specifically, they have a program set up for people with disabilities and working with them. So I include that as well. One of the last things um, I'll just mention here is legal service organizations. Um, I won't go too into it, but um, I wanted to make sure that um, you all had some resources 
Again, if you run into any issues with any of your supports and services that you are receiving from these various agencies or organizations, and you find yourself in need of legal assistance, these are some free and low cost um, legal assistance. Um, and they will also, um, uh, many of them will also give you referrals too. Um, and these ones in particular, really focus in on disability related uh, legal issues. So things like um, ABLE law, community legal aid, CARE Ohio will even help with things like discrimination and so forth. Disability Rights Ohio has um, plethora, plethora of uh, civil rights and legal rights and, and so forth, resources and assistance programs and these types of things and um, legal aid as well. Legal aid is, um, especially when it comes to the Medicaid services and issues with the Medicaid programs, appeals, um, complaints, and so forth, they are also um, definitely an organization to turn to in those situations. Um, and then I went ahead and listed some more. Of course, we have Muslim Family Services, uh, My Project USA, the Ohio State Bar Association um, helps provide attorney referrals. Um, and pro seniors and so forth. Finally, um, uh, I just wanted to make sure, because I know that you know I did kind of a really quick <laughs> overview of a lot of these various systems uh, and organizations. And so it's hard to kind of keep all of this straight. Um, there are many different acronyms. I'm sure you heard me say throughout this presentation, so it can be rather confusing. So I at least wanted to make sure I provided a list of the various state agencies um, for people with disabilities, um, including the various um, advocacy and professional organizations. Again, this is not a complete list, um, but I just wanted to make sure that you at least had a list of the ones that, you know, are often utilized. Um, for advocacy, for individual supports, and so forth. Finally, um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on Mohsen at Noor. Um, you know, Mohsen at Noor is committed to helping individuals with disabilities and their families. If you have a family member with special needs, please, um, I included this link here. Um, it is um, the program interest form. If you know of someone who uh, within our community with special needs who might be interested in being part of the Mohsen uh, support group and learning about Mohsen initiatives at Noor, please provide this link to them. Um, I've also included contact information. If any of you have any questions, please do not feel do not hesitate to reach out. Please feel free to contact us at any time at mohsen at noorohio.org. And I've also included the phone number. Inshallah, you found um, something beneficial in this talk. I know we went through a lot. Um, again, it really is more of an informational session in hopes that um, you, when you do have more time, you're able to kind of go through the presentation, review the material, see the resource links, and if you, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Jazakum Allah khair and have a wonderful day, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. All right, Jazakum khair, sister uh, Suzanne, for sharing um, all of these resources with us today. I'm actually really excited to see where some of these changes are going, especially with like Ohio Rise and being able to have things simplified for our families. Um, due to the timing, we are not going to open it up for questions, but as Sister Su Suzanne said, um, the email is there, um, and so just would like to remind you to, as you're giving charity, to please remember, um, the Nor Islamic, uh, Cultural Center so that we're able to continue producing content like this for our community. Muslim at Nor Ohio is an NICC program that strives to ensure that the masjid is accessible to all. Nor has achieved the silver level of the Muslim certification and is working towards the gold level, uh, inshallah. Um, as was mentioned, we can be reached at Muslim at norohio.org. The Parent Support Group is also an NICC program that works in collaboration with Muslim. 
We strive to bring uh, parenting education to our community. If you would like to receive notifications for future events or would like to suggest events, please send an email to psg at norohio.org to sign up for the Google group. You can also reach all of our education uh, programming via education at norohio.org or by following our social media handles at NICC Education. And let's see, and we'll include all of those emails there for you. Um, once again, Jazakallah Khairan, uh, Sister Suzanne, and we look forward to future collaborations with you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everyone and stay healthy and well, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.